So namaste, welcome to satsang today. And as always, satsang is the place that we come for the direct realization of the truth of our being, of our real nature. We are not actually, in fact, a separate being. We're not this mind and body only. We are this too, but we're not that only. And that's what we're here to realize experientially, not just to think about it. Because to think about it isn't really going to give us uh, peace. It's not going to give us a deep sense of contentment and joy and love that is emerging. So to come to realize it experientially is what satsang is for. And uh, it's not something that's difficult to do, although we have widely as a species believed that it's difficult and it's rare. And this is the perhaps the biggest challenge we face in these times. And there are so many um, beings now waking up, coming into greater clarity really challenging this idea that there's only a few beings in every generation that are going to uh, be able to fully realize the truth of their nature. And we see more and more of this. And this is really what I had to push through myself, this idea that um, it couldn't happen for me, that I'm just a normal, ordinary person and you know that it happens to someone who is extraordinary or something like that. So let's start by throwing that out because we are only returning to our natural state. The natural state of a human being when we're not believing our thoughts. And the major thought, of course, is that we're only this mind and body. Uh, our natural state is peace, love and joy. And the experience of abundance in all the ways it can show up. So we're not doing anything um, difficult. We're not turning into something different than we already are. We're only remembering, and that's a different thing, isn't it? We're coming to remember what we seem to have forgotten. So that's very doable, very, um, and especially as more and more of us wake up, the more this collective belief goes into human beings, into society, that it is not only possible for us to wake up fully, but it's probable <clears throat> and then certain. And this belief is going to get more and more prevalent in the human consciousness, that it is our next evolutionary step. And boy, do we need to take it as a species. And that's what's occurring, unfolding right now. So I wanted to use this time. I've got a lot of questions uh, that have been sent in. I'm gonna to try to get through as many as possible. And um, there'll be time for some questions here if anybody has a question that they want or something they need help with here on this session too. So I'll get started. We have uh, nine here in total. Let's see what we can get through. Uh, dear Helen, is there any practice or technique that can help with consistently dark or frightening dreams? I've mostly been dismissing them as simply dreams and enjoying waking life, but it came up in a Sangha meeting. So I wanted to ask you if you had any, any insights on this. I thank you so much for everything you share. So just as Claire was mentioning before, we have these Sangha meetups that are free, open to anyone working with these teachings from anywhere, join over Zoom, don't have to even talk or anything if you don't feel brave enough, but just to meet like-minded friends. Quite often things like this that people are struggling with will come up in a Sangha meetup. So <clears throat> for me, the dreams uh, that I was having were very frightening and um they reached a certain frequency uh, right before I was um, actually after I'd had a deeper seeing and, and before and after. And as I was working through things that I was still believing that weren't in line with what I'd seen myself to be. So things I was still believing about being a separate being, they came up in my dreams at nighttime, mostly fear, uh, shame. And it, it's been my experience that in something I'm not able to see yet in my waking state may come in a dream, not as a, uh, a direct message, but perhaps just some emotion that runs throughout the dream. So I'd wake up in the nighttime after this kind of dream, feeling really, really scared. Usually some variation of something chasing me, me trying to get away and not succeeding, something, and I've 
spoken about that before, but so I'd suggest looking at uh, what are the major emotions that are present in these dreams. You've mentioned dark and frightening dreams. So fear um, is prevalent in that and looking at using a contemplation technique, asking this emotion for a moment, just setting aside the dream itself, looking at the emotions that come up and asking that emotion, that fear, what it wants to tell you. What, what is the belief that I story that's underneath this emotion, that this emotion is coming from? And my dreams were showing me that I didn't feel safe. Uh, and perhaps more specifically, I felt some part of my egoic sense of self imagined the Newman on the pure awareness, the, the God, the divinity, to be this big, bad, scary parent figure that's going to be really angry with me. And I was literally trying to run away from my own uh, real nature, which didn't work so well, of course. But So asking, looking at what major emotions are present there in the dream state, and then doing that, you're bringing it into the waking state so you can work with it consciously and you're not just kind of having to go through it at night time. It's only things that we haven't been able or willing to see yet in the waking state that needs to show up in our dreams at night time. For me, I began to work with it consciously like this. It began to, to change. And I only had it a couple more times after that, but it was different. The first time, I think, uh, after I started really looking at it, this big bad thing that was chasing me, instead of it getting me and killing me, I think... Um, I actually just stopped running and let it come to me in the same ending. But the, that was the second to last time. The last time I remember getting, just standing there in my dream, turning around and running towards it, which is very symbolic of the work I was doing in the waking state, no longer scared of it, realizing this big bad monster was how my separate sense of self saw the self, the universal self. I hope that's helpful just to want to bring it into the waking state to see that something I haven't been able to look at before and then working with the emotion is enough to kind of, uh, it's quite disturbing, isn't it? And it disturbs your sleep as well. So, uh, Next one, thank you for your satsangs, Helen, and thanks to all those who make them possible. Please will you address the sensation that I am separate from what is going on around me. The body goes through its routines and events Thoughts, sensations, emotions arise and subside and life goes on, but it's not happening to me. Thank you. So this is a kind of a stage that we go through on our awakening journey where I no longer feel so much that I'm doing these things. Uh, whatever my body's doing is what my body's doing. Whatever it's feeling is what it's feeling. And there's less and less identification with that. So we might find ourselves saying, there's fear, uh, there's fear present in my body rather than I'm scared. Or we might use the word I'm scared, but it doesn't have the same um, tug inside, the same tension. So I'm just watching my body go about its business, me, the awareness. And in that, some emotions going to come up, some sensations, sense perceptions going on. And it's not so much that I'm not separate to what's going on. It's that I no longer feel it's affecting me. There isn't a separate me that I'm uh, recreating in imagination that's having to deal with this emotion, going to relationship with this emotion or this sense perception or this uh, thought that's going on. So every moment, our sense of a separate sense of self is trying to engage with whatever phenomenon it's experiencing in that moment whether that's these words right now something inside when you're listening might be trying to go into relationship with them trying to understand them trying to use them trying to figure them out and our truest nature is just to be listening i'm just listening i don't need to do anything with what i'm hearing the just listening is enough so it's a, it's a sense um, that uh, it's all just happening and I'm not doing anything. And I'm not personally now affected as a separate being by these phenomena that come and go. They can all just arise and subside, as you said here. 
and they're not actually directly affecting me. And that means also it's not my work to get rid of them or change them. That's a massive shift there, isn't it? That I'm not running around my life trying to micromanage it all the time. And then surprisingly, well, sometimes not the phenomena that I'm trying to get rid of tend to go anyway. It's usually some negative emotions, thoughts, and the ones that I've been wanting tend to, to come from that place. So everything we've ever experienced when we thought we were a separate being, this mind and body only, has been experienced as if it's happening to me, this mythical legendary me here, this separate being that we can't really find when we look. And then there's this different stage where we begin to realize that's not really what's been happening. And the reason I've been suffering is because it's, I've been feeling it's affecting me here, this fear, I'm feeling it here. But when we really look, all we can find is there's fear, there's a body, and then there's the awareness of both of those. So I'm not going to um, grasp a hold of this in a separate way and feel so much that I have to do something about this. And they're not my karmic patterns then, they're just patterns, they're just ways of thinking and feeling about things that happen in a body. And very different experience. It gets more and more subtle and profound. And then eventually you don't even see any difference between yourself and the phenomena that are arising. They don't have uh, the, the names and labels of everything don't have the same fascination anymore. I hope that one is helpful. So it says, hi, Helen, I just listened to your satsang where you support people in self-inquiry. When I do self-inquiry, I always get to a point that seems bound to me. I would really appreciate any feedback. When I inquire, I see there is no person per se. There is just body, mind, impulses in forms of emotion, thoughts, etc. So I see a kind of programmed computer, brain being the chip, and then the experience in form of its activity and interpretations. And then I ask, well, who is aware of all this? And yes, there is no one to be found, just awareness, stillness, quietness. But if I let go of all spiritual concepts also, how can I know the brain can't be aware of itself? Stillness just being the absence then of brain activity and just its perception of the now. I don't have proof I'm boundless. My awareness is limited to the body. I used to find myself boundless, but now it seems to me it was just a spiritual belief. I would very appreciate your comment. Thank you for being available to the world. It really, it's really a blessing. Thank you. This is um something that I remember going through as well. Couldn't find a separate being. There was a body, there was emotions, as I was just saying. And there was um, awareness of those sensations, emotions, thoughts, and awareness of a body and it didn't feel uh, this awareness when I first noticed it we could call it stillness silence consciousness beingness presence whatever uh, noumenon it didn't feel limitless and boundless it felt just like something finite and limited and this question also came up for me what if awareness is a function of my brain and is that awareness then going to die when this brain dies and will I be no longer existing? If what I, what I find when I look for myself is the awareness, then I must be that. I can't find a separate being in the awareness. But is this awareness permanent and stable and immortal and all of that? So... It might seem like it's a spiritual concept, but here is where your mind is giving you this last doubt to look at. It's saying, we can't be sure, or I can't be sure, mind says that this awareness is limitless, boundless. And I need you to help me with it, it's saying. So um, I don't have proof I'm boundless. My awareness is limited to the body. I used to find myself boundless, but now it seems it was just a spiritual belief. So I really like you to look at that, not to look at this as a failure, 
here's your mind very bravely sharing with you this doubt and asking for your help to resolve it so that you can come to permanent peace. A real deep understanding that you're not going to go when the body goes, that awareness can't disappear. So this awareness, you say, is limited to the body. I want you to look at why do you feel that way. If awareness is a function of the brain, then it would be a finite, limited phenomenon that comes when the brain comes and goes when the brain goes. If we can prove then experientially that awareness is not a phenomenon, it's not limited, and perhaps most importantly, that it's not coming and going, that it's not a phenomenon at all, then it begins to become clear that it's not at all something that's limited. The waking state depends on the brain, but not the awareness. The waking state being a kind of symptom, um, a side effect, an outpouring of this awareness coming through a human brain, taking the shape of a human brain also. So why do you feel that this awareness is limited to the body? Here's the crux of it. It seems that way. When I, As I said, when I noticed the awareness, first of all, it felt like a something. It felt like my awareness. It felt limited. I was convinced that if anybody was sat next to me on the sofa, that my awareness would stop somewhere in between the two bodies and theirs would start. Let's look at awareness. What actually is it? Is it a thing? Try to find it. Try to find where it is. It really, really, really seems like it's limited to the body, but we must really challenge that and go with what we can prove here and not with what seems to be. If we stay with the seems to be, we'll be stuck forever. We want to prove experientially here and now that this isn't limited to the body. Where is this awareness? It's here. Where isn't it? Where does it stop? Is it a thing? You know, my hand has a size and shape because it's a thing. But is awareness like that? Is it limited to a form or is it formless? If it's formless, can it have an edge? Can anything that's not a form have an actual edge? So looking at it like this, I really challenge this idea. I'm just being really determined here for you to see clearly here. It seems like awareness is limited to the body or silence, stillness, consciousness, presence. But really pushing through that with a determination. I want to see. I want to know. I don't just want to hang out where there seems to be of it. And that's why your mind is giving you this doubt now so that you can come to a final experiential conclusion here awareness isn't limited by anything at all and we must really be willing to push through this last idea that uh, it seems to be finite and limited and belonging to me or belonging to the body uh, but if we look we'll find it doesn't have any edges doesn't have any shape doesn't have a start point only something that's manifested has a start point and only something that is manifested has an end point where the visible uh, form disappears and appears and then disappears. Is awareness like that? Can you point to where it is? Is it here or there? Does it have a location like a thing? My body's sitting here in this room, in this town, in this country. Can I say that about awareness? Where is it really? Where isn't it? How far does it reach? in all directions from, from my body. Is my brain using awareness or is awareness using my brain? So just real desire to push through this once and for all. And you'll kind of uh, uh, awaken this power within you to see this clearly. Just being determined to prove experientially and you can right now, rather than go with this seems to be of it. Proving experientially that awareness is not a phenomenon. It's before phenomena and all phenomena arise in it, including your body, including your brain. And proving again and again that there isn't a separate being in awareness. 
and it becomes very clear, just known deep, 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 without any doubt eventually, that I am this awareness and I'm not limited at all. This is a good thing that's happening, uh, but it feels like a setback. What I used to be so sure of, now I don't know. But that's only because uh, now you want to move past this last doubt that's coming up. So this one says, hi, Helen. Um, I'm meditating daily on the silence and I find it very comforting. I'm also noticing the quietness stays with me for the majority of the day. But there's a concern I have. Since the last few days, I'm having some headaches and dizziness in my head. The pain is not sharp, though it is pain is not sharp, though, but it is bothering me. My mind also never shuts up, and I feel the personal identity or whatever is left of it is resisting my growth. It seems that I am unable to let go of it. I feel stuck, and there are headaches to add to it. Please help me understand my situation, Helen. I'm deeply grateful to you and your help. Uh, much love and regards. So first of all, if it's bothering you, um, then get it checked out, you know, just to put your mind at rest. If you need to see the doctor, go for it. Um, just to put your mind at rest, at least in that way. Uh, and just because we might intuit that it has some deeper spiritual cause, this pain, doesn't mean we can't look after the body also, you know, so whatever you need to do to help the body, it, it's absolutely okay, whilst also inquiring into this pain in a deeper way. So this is now coming forward because the peace, the quietness, the silence here, it is coming more and more forward into the forefront of your experience in the waking state and your old personal identity is moving that they're switching over. It used to be mostly this separate being and a little bit of silence, and now it's gradually moving the other way. And for that to complete itself, any ideas that are in the way of that, where I still am thinking in terms of being a separate being, has to come up for me to examine that and to look at that. So this pain is trying to tell you something, and because it's had to come up as physical pain, it's probably some idea that you're holding on to that you really don't want to see on some, on a conscious level, you do want to get to the bottom of this. Uh, on an unconscious level, in our egoic sense of self, something is saying, no, this is a bad idea to look at this. So I just suggest gently sitting with it. What is it this that this is trying to tell me? And um, maybe also why don't I want to see this on some level? Not not with a, uh, as a blame thing, just I'm really curious, what, what do I feel is gonna be so bad if I see this? Just gently unpicking that, this self-protective mechanism that our egoic sense of self has to protect these beliefs because to, to the ego, they are true. To the self, silence, they're not. But just gently working with our ego to say, okay, is it is it actually true that this is going to be a terrible thing to see it? Do I really need to still section this part of me off and not look at it? That might have been a really good idea years ago when this idea first came up, when I felt like a separate being and I didn't know how to go beyond it. But now, does it serve me now to hold on to this? So looking at it like that, any physical pain is usually a reflection of some sense of unworthiness or guilt uh, some feeling that we're not good enough and it will also be accompanied by some area of your life where it isn't flowing your life isn't flowing very well so just looking at that do I still feel not quite good enough somewhere do I still feel unworthy and being gentle with yourself that we all have these places inside ourselves that we've walled off, blocked off, because as a separate being, there was no way to transcend it fully. There's no way to deal with the emotion of unworthiness if I think it's true and I aren't good enough. It's only really after seeing and feeling a lot of stillness and silence that there's nothing actually wrong with me, that I'm not actually this separate being, that I am the formless infinite silence. 
even if I haven't realized that massively, the fact that you, you're saying here, you're feeling a lot of silence and peace and it's going more and more throughout your day means it is happening. Now this idea is so far out of alignment, some sense of needing to um, punish yourself because, you know, if I don't do it to myself, something else, somebody else will. And that by punishing myself somehow, I'm going to make myself worthy. And that can never really work because you're not unworthy in the first place. It's just a deeply held idea that we've really given a lot of validity to up until this point. So doing your best to not judge yourself and understand why you might want to protect this and not see it. And then just giving it permission to come to the surface. And um, knowing that that's all you need to do to see this. And then it'll just begin to see it. It'll lose its power and the body will start to feel better as a life force that's been blocked by this belief starts to flow through into these areas of the body. And um, see where you get with that. And, you know, if you, if you get stuck, let me know and we can look at where you've got to on that. Okay. Next one. Thank you for your satsangs, Helen, and thanks to all who make these possible. Okay, I think we've got the same one twice here. No problem. Next one. Uh, thank you so much in advance for taking questions, Helen. My question is around the seeming paradox of actually realizing oneself to be the only one here. The mind sees this state as lonesome and pitiful, the only survivor on the deserted island. Yes, on the one hand, I am all there is, the boundless and the fullness, uh, but with whom can I share it? I think this is why the leap required by the mind from uh, to dissolving into the one is the fear which pulls the heart back from realizing its truth in safe separation, safe in inverted commas. How can I bridge this fear? My heart longs and breaks to return home. Much love. So again, I remember this. Um, it's all well and good realizing that I am the only one, but it felt like it was going to cost me too much, that I'll lose all these other beings that I have um, been interacting with. And this fear was very prevalent for me, held me back for quite some time. And eventually, uh, after some examination, I began to see that um, if I was the only one that existed, if I'm everywhere, that's not just happening now. That's how it's always been. If I can't find a separate being when I look now, if I look at that, I realize that's never been the case ever. It's not just that there's no separate being now. There never has been. I've always been the only thing that exists. You've always been the only one that exists, showing up as all of this. Your form, your body is the cosmos. And it's always been that way. The reason I'm saying this is because it gets past this fear because our mind is sure that when you let this in, something's going to change. Something's going to change. You're, you're, you'll have this experience or something will be different. But you're only seeing now how it's always been. You're only seeing how it's always been. So why should anything change at all in your outside world by recognizing this? And all that changed for me when I realized this is actually, you know, feeling like I'm separate being hasn't been that safe for me anyway, being tormented by everything and everyone in my own mind, at least. Um, had some very negative experiences, unpleasant experiences, I'm sure we all have. And as I come to see how it's always been, what's it like then to interact with myself everywhere consciously? Because I've always been doing that, I've always been interacting with myself at all times. But now consciously, what's that experience going to be like? And you don't lose that sense of duality. The sense of duality is not a mistake. It's actually the one being that you are playing joyfully. I can look like this. I can look like this and this and this and this and this and this. So even for me now, still, there is a sense of duality. The sense that 
that you who sent the question in is different to me. Your body, if we sat together in the same room, your, your body will look different to mine, sound different to mine, like different foods. You'd like different movies, read different things. The sense of duality is still there. And it's not an issue then. The sense of two-ness or multiplicity, diversity, never goes away while the body's here. And it's not a mistake when she realizes it's not true. You can actually embrace it then. So this fear that you're going to lose something in this realization will begin to disappear when you recognize it's always been this way. You're just kind of now going like this. Oh, and seeing clearly how it's always been. This is how I got around this fear because instead of me being the only survivor on a desert island, I, I can realize I've been the only one that's ever been here despite what I thought was going on. It's never been so. And that realization just began to, as I thought about this more and more, I looked at it again and again. I started to realize there's no reason anything could change. And what I experience now, in my senses, is exactly the same as it was before. The only difference is there's no conflict in here and there's no ability to go into conflict in here. There's no need to overly think about everything and everyone because I know they're not separate to me. This is the quietness and a peace. So can you see this idea that something's going to change if you let this in? It's utter nonsense. I had it too, but just to recognize it's not true. You're just looking and seeing this is how it's always been. And then all of yourself begins to interact with you in a way um, that it couldn't do before while we were sure that we were separate. You begin to have a much more pleasant experience uh, everywhere you go. Okay. Next one. We've got three more. Um, if anybody wants to ask any questions, uh, I'll go through these three and then we'll open it up. Feel free to raise your hand if you want to. Uh, dear Helen, words cannot express the gratitude I feel for you. Thank you. Um, you have helped me so much. Thank you for being such a kind and gentle teacher. I've watched all your satsangs and read Dissolving the Ego. About a year ago, I started the 30-day challenge and just kept going. Wow. So a year of 30-day challenge. Got some real momentum going there. I've been meditating for about three or four hours a day, and I have an issue with shoulder pain, which sometimes makes meditation, contemplation, etc., very uncomfortable and hard to do. I've contemplated it every way I can think of. The emotion behind it is anger, and the belief is I'll never be good enough for God. I'm just stuck. So when I was four, my father started uh, molesting me, and my mother blamed me and yelled at me and called me a naughty little girl. I know that's just a story, and I love and have forgiven both my parents because they certainly drove me to want to know God or truth. I'm only mentioning it because when I contemplate, there's always this voice in my head saying, Mama, Mama, over and over. I just watch it. I have experienced the stillness a lot. Last week, as I got out of the shower, I had this beautiful knowing that everything was just life, no separate me or anything. After the childhood thing, I started getting very bad migraines from about age six, and they didn't disappear until I was 52. Then the shoulder pain started. So the pain seems to be a bit of a theme. I greatly appreciate any help on this pain issue. P.S. It's taken me a year to work up the courage to even type this letter. Well, let me start by saying, well done. That's huge. And he here is this. It's taken you a year, but you've done it. You've overcome these limitations. And next time, maybe it won't take you so long. You'll see that sharing this, reaching out, opening is something that you can do easier and that you will be accepted and loved unconditionally no matter what you send and that um, there's help here available for you and that you do deserve that help and that peace and, and to be free of this uh, pain as it's showing up. So you might have forgiven your parents and you might have come to a peace with that and that's great, amazing spiritual work in itself, not always so easy to do. Um, 
But this voice that's asking for mama, what is it asking for when it comes up? Could it be that um, what's left out of this for you to, to um, absorb, to understand is that just because uh, you've let go of uh, grievances in the past, maybe you're still looking for that approval, that recognition that would have come from your parents had this not happened. You know, in an ideal um, parent-child relationship, there'd be this approval and uh, respect and um, love that comes unconditionally from the parent to the child. And you haven't had that experience. So something inside is asking mama, please, you know, can I have this now? Um, I, I really want this. And so looking at what is it you didn't feel that you got from that relationship that you're still looking for now inside? When I look to this myself, all of my relationships, I was asking them to, the people in my relationships, to love me, to like me, to respect me, most of all, to approve of me and um, to give me that validation I couldn't allow inside myself as yet. So what, what is it you'd want from mama if you could ask her now and she'd say she'd give you anything? Or from God, as you've put here, this belief, I'll never be good enough for God. Why? Why is that the case? What is it you think that you need to change about yourself? And is that true? Would God really ever be able to reject anything or anyone? Are ideas about God different to what God actually is, this unconditionally loving, uh, not even able to be conditionally loving, I'll love you when or if, just loving, no other, no other function, no other option for God than to unconditionally love. And this is what we're looking from, from, in, from this little voice as well. So what is it you would want from your mom and from God? And why can't you have that now? Why can't you begin to allow that for yourself? Giving this to yourself, allowing yourself to approve of yourself right now as you are. No excuses, no, nothing needing to change. However your life is right now is how it is. It's not a good enough excuse for me to, to withhold love from yourself. However your body looks, however your finances are, it all might be in a big upside down mess right now. It may be not, but um, it's not a good enough excuse for me to withhold love anymore. Approval for your own self. And that really is God giving it to you because you are that. And seeing what we think we still need and then allowing it to come from the inside out. I had to learn to like myself again and approve of myself again. Uh, and which didn't come as easy as loving myself unconditionally, yes. Uh, but then do I have to even like myself to approve of myself? Am I my biggest fan? Or am I my worst, uh, own worst critic? Most of us would probably answer the latter. So what do you feel you need in terms of approval or recognition or validation from others? And can you allow that? So this little voice is saying, it's time now to let this come from you to you. And then everyone else around you can agree with you. While you still think you need it, it won't be able to come. And this, this little voice is saying that inside. So hope that helps. And well done, well done. A year, it's a long time to sit with this. So well done for allowing that and uh, sending it in. It's a, it's a huge thing, isn't it? You'll only ever get unconditional love and acceptance from me because I don't know how to do anything else now. And uh, there's nothing you could do to ever upset me or make me mad at you. It's just, I just can't do it now and it's beautiful. So hope that puts your mind at rest. Okay, two more. Um, hi, Helen. Firstly, thank you so much for your love, kindness and generosity in sharing. This body mind is empathic. At various times, images of someone's face and heavy emotions enter my consciousness and they feel hard to shake. So much so that even if watching a movie, etc., it will be completely distracting and seemingly absorbed in someone else's energy field. Oftentimes, a person will call the next day or same day, and that's how I know I've been picking their vibe up. 
consciousness is really beginning to expand here now and it's becoming obvious that there's no separation so of course no actual other their energy is my energy is it just trying to teach me to expand even more into nothingness is it only remnants of separation that feel uncomfortable how does one remain completely open and allow energy to just be transmuted without suffering it thanks and lots of love so um for me when this was happening it, it was showing me that there was still a real sense of me and other even though i'd seen clearly over and over again that there wasn't i still had to apply it in this area so i'd be sitting on my own you know this body on its own in in this room and i feel fine and then if i go to a place where there's a few people together I start to pick up other people's energy and really feel uh, one of two ways, either really uplifted, really euphoric or the opposite. And even if I felt very uplifted, I could only do that for so long before it came overwhelming and I had to uh, take my leave and run back to my safe space. And their energy is my energy. It's true, but it's still two, isn't it? There's a minor one. Here's the, how the mind tries to think about oneness me and this person are the same but there's still two the word same indicates two doesn't it two things so instead of um trying to figure out where it came from just as you said here uh, if you've got the answer here intuitively anyway just completely open and allowing whatever energy if my body feels some energy that needs to be transmuted some uh negative emotion there isn't that capacity now to kind of look at where it came from because I'm really not that interested in that way I'm just okay here's an energy that needs to be felt and this body can do it so there's less and less kind of um it's that person's and, and I'm feeling it here because just that little separation will become uh, intolerable and you'll find it hard to actually be with the energy then it will become too much or it will be draining something like that so just all we can really say is that there's an energy in the body you know where where we think it's come from is just the mind doing its thing isn't it this is my fear or that's someone else's fear and i'm feeling it for them not really true is it it's just fear in whichever body it's showing up or unworthiness or sadness or whatever that is i hope that helps okay we've got one more and then we'll come to you elaine okay hi helen these last few weeks i've been listening to your guided meditations when i do there are certain thoughts that reappear again and again and these are uh, in no particular order no not good not enough not good enough this moment is wrong this moment should be different i should be doing something different i spent hours and hours and hours on this these thoughts have become so familiar that i almost enjoy when they appear and when i go deeply into the last one for example i should be doing something different then i sometimes have this momentary hunch that maybe just maybe me allowing that thought to express itself is exactly what i should be doing in that moment i don't have a question really but a comment would be appreciated uh, p.s i've been seeking intensely for 10 about 10 years without real finding and yet i'm afraid to stop seeking even just for one second because i'm afraid that i might not find it's comically absurd it's not funny when you're going through that though is it? it's it's afterwards it's like that's just nuts but at the time it's like ah pps your vo your soft voice is like a soothing balm on a sore wound thank you warm greetings from Chile, iceland i'd like to go to iceland just just throwing that out there It'd be nice if we could uh uh travel there so always wanted to see it so thank you for your lovely words there um and, and here is the the crux of all the, the separate sense of self that's really obstructing our peace it's not an entity it's a it's a movement, it's a habit, it's an energy, it's a vibration. And when we look at what it is, really, it's trying to 
change this moment in some way, isn't it? And it'll say, I'm not how I'm supposed to be. You're not how you're supposed to be. This moment isn't how it's supposed to be. This meditation isn't how it's supposed to be. Uh, this uh, contemplation isn't going the way it's supposed to be. And it's not always so overt, but it's kind of this one track, very single-minded, pushing against what is. And if you have that thought in, in any, you're sitting in meditation, getting nice and deep, and this thought comes up, I should be doing something different. Uh, what we really experience is the meditation and the thought. And that is all there is. There isn't a separate being thinking. There isn't a separate being meditating. And I loved what you put. I sometimes have this momentary hunch that maybe, just maybe, me allowing that thought to express itself is exactly what I should be doing in that moment. Yeah, because if you can just let that thought happen in its fullness, just let it happen, not being at war with your mind for just a second, not saying it should or shouldn't be this way, which is also mind. What happens when you just let that thought happen? Even if your attention goes with it for a certain amount of time, it comes back eventually. And the more you fully go with that thought, let it exist, oh, have at it. Whatever wants to exist in this moment can. I'm not going to try and police that at all. Most of all, my own thought process. What happens when you do that? Because the essence of this should and shouldn't is a trying to control, isn't it? Trying to keep this moment in a way that's going to make me feel better or keep me safe or something like that. And if I don't have any thoughts and don't allow my thoughts, mine says then I'm more awakened. And if I have loads of thoughts, I'm less awakened. What if that's not true? What if it's what I'm doing with those thoughts or not doing? Perhaps more importantly, when they come up. And the essence of awakening is really just being with what is and not really being able to or wanting to do anything other than that. So you sat there in meditation or just having a happy moment with your family, some real resistance comes up, something comes up. What do you do with that? If it's just, okay, now there's resistance, then that's a very awakened way of being with it. If instead we go to, why is this here? What do I need to do to get rid of it? I thought I'd got beyond this. Why is it happening again? These are all very subtle ways of trying to push against that resistance and go into separation in relationship with it. And then by doing that, we're trying to change ourselves, change this moment, change reality. All those are the same. Myself, this moment, reality, they're all names for you. So have, have a have a meditation session where, and everyone can do this, I'm just going to let it happen. Even if it's that like, this shouldn't be occurring, I'm going to let that thought happen too. What would the love Love sees these thoughts as its creations. They're arising out of it like steam off of hot water. And the water isn't trying to control how the steam is going, is it? It's just arising, whichever way it wants to arise. You can be like that with all phenomena, just kind of, this is what is in this moment. Some of them you might like better than others. Some thoughts, some emotions, that type of thing. Uh, so of course, we like bliss better than physical pain or will like joy better than sadness, will like a self-loving thought more than a self-critical thought, but we still have the ability nonetheless to just be with that. So have a go. You intuitively know this anyway. You nailed it anyway completely. Just um, You can actually feel deep bliss if you, uh, a deep sense of peace, contentment, and eventually bliss if you just let your mind be how it is right now. If it's running rampant, just stop trying to control it completely. Abandon all attempts to change it and you'll feel extraordinarily peaceful even before it stops talking. And you won't even need it to stop talking. You'll begin to feel bliss and, and you know, some deep, deep sense of joy that this isn't my work to manage my own personal universe. Oh, hope to see chilly Iceland one day, hint, hint. Okay, we'll go to Elaine. 
just saying I love traveling by the way you know in case anyone's listening hi Elaine hi Helen hi okay um I just um there's been a lot of talk about the one and the self this morning and mm -hmm. um awareness where is awareness in unconsciousness i i've had covid all week and so i've had huge um bouts of unconsciousness and um i'm just well, it's disrupting. <laughs> it's disrupting what I think consciousness should be. You know, I can't, meditation is like gone. You know, I mean, maybe I've been meditating, maybe I haven't. Um, but it's, and I can't, I can't shake that unconsciousness off. It just sort of happens. It's like, um, and how do I, how do I, uh, what is COVID? I mean, you, you know, I'll just give, it, that's the label that it is because it's got a test and I've tested. And so I know it, well, the test says it's that. Um, how do I, how am I one with that? Why? <laughs> so, so um, Let's start with what you first said, unconsciousness. What what do you mean by unconsciousness? What what actually is how do you know you've been unconscious? What's what's what what evidence have you got for that? Time. Is it, say again? Time. You know. Um, so are, are you specifically are you saying there's been lots of negative thoughts and emotions? Is that what you're calling unconsciousness or no? Um, no thoughts, just time has disappeared. And as far as I'm aware, I've just been in one place. I've been lying because you know, I haven't felt that active. Um, okay, so when, let's say you're laying on the sofa because you feel terrible and you're just laying there and you realise that some time has passed and you weren't, um, you didn't have a sense of time you know, you, you look at the clock, it's 10 to 10. Next thing you look, it's half past 12. And, you know, where did that go? It seems like I've been unconscious or unaware, doesn't it, at that, that moment? It seems like you've missed the gap, so to speak. But something now can use the waking state to tell me between 10 past 10 and half past 12, there was no sense of time. Right. Can you agree yes. with that? Yes. So something yes. was watching up until 10 past 10. I had a sense of time. And then in between 10 past 10 to half past 12, no sense of time. And suddenly I looked at the clock again and the sense of time came back in. Something is watching that continuous unfolding. To know that there's unconsciousness, there must be something knowing it's there watching it. Just like now, you know there's consciousness. You know there's awareness of it. <clears throat> so could it be that awareness was watching the sense of time? Then for a while it watched the sense of no time, like it does in deep sleep. And then it watched the sense of time again. We don't have any memory of that section of no time because time and memory are really the same thing. But it's experienced in a different way, but it's not necessarily the absence of awareness. Awareness is watching no sense of time. Just like if you and I were doing something really fun right now, having mm -hmm. so much fun that we forgot what time it was. There'd still be something that knew we were having fun all that time. The sense of time doesn't necessarily need to be constant in that. Does that help with that first bit? Yeah, that's really reassuring. I've got to say, I'm cuddling Teddy Bear right now. Yeah. <laughs> Just... yeah. We've all got one. We've all got yeah. one. 46, 47 year old woman, I've got one. <laughs> Actually, I've got two, if I'm honest. But yeah. yeah. Um, so 
So awareness is watching continuously, even, even when the body's asleep, it's watching right now. There's no time. There's no duality. There's no sense perception. There's no memory. There's no desire. There's no anything. But I'm there to watch and know there's no anything. Right. And the alarm goes off at 7 a.m. or whatever. Now there's a sense of time. Now there's duality. Now there's sense perception. Now there's groaning and trying to get out of bed or whatever's going on. Yeah. yeah so what was this, the, next, the second bit about you wanted to look at COVID? Yeah. Well, you know, it, that's, that's what it, yeah. So, uh, so what, what do you think? Look at it? How can I look at it as being one, you know, as, as the one, as not as being something that is alien to me, that's invaded me? Yeah. And you Let's look like at it. it. Let, let's look at it. What actually is your experience of COVID? We could say, uh, for the sake of time here, if we went into this question deeply together, what actually is it? We could do it with anything. Yeah. What we'd probably end up with is, well, it's this feeling in my throat. It's this feeling in my chest. It's this sense of weakness in my body. It's this emotion that comes with it. It's these thoughts. It's so you, you're experiencing it right now as a certain set of uh, feelings in the body, maybe some emotions coming up with that, maybe some thoughts, stories around it. That That's your actual experience right now, isn't it? Or some variation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if we really go beyond this label COVID and actually deeper into it, what we actually experience is a certain... Um, collection of sensations which might be different moment to moment in the body and some thoughts and some emotions some yeah. stories being yeah, told yeah. by the mind you know all of that yeah and is there anyone uh experiencing covid now or is there just this that's happening and this body <laughs> right yeah so we can we can believe more in this label than we can actually get yeah. when we did get in touch with the actual experience and if you if you really look at what the actual experience of it is there'll be a sense of being one with it and of course you wouldn't choose this of course you don't want it to continue but mm. we don't have to experience it while it's here in separation with it, do we? We can just be oh. with whatever is happening. Yeah. I, I, that was a question as well. You know, what is it here to show? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what is it? So, yeah, going beyond it. Is, so for yeah. me, illness and things like that, um, I used to have a lot of stories about illness because I wasn't, didn't get ill very often, still don't, but... When I did, there was a lot of, um, for, for me at least, a lot of poor me, you know, like, oh, oh you know, yeah. the world is ending. And um, it was such a relief. I won't go as far as use the word joy, but it was a deep relief and contentment to just be able to be ill. Yeah. Without the stories of, you know, why, uh, why have I got this? Who did I get it from? And what am I going to do about this? And I should be able to make this go away with my spiritual knowledge and all of that stuff you know that used to go on yeah. Yeah. I can just be ill I can for the first time in my life I can just feel ill and then I'm not resisting it and there was a real sense the body feels quite terrible right now but I'm okay and I, I love the body and support it and do what I can in that well thank you because I think all week I have been doing what you've just said I've been resisting it I've been um, and of course we would right we don't want to feel this way yeah yeah, yeah. the stories um the stories don't always help do they they make things worse no but i was able to sit through this this morning which i haven't been able to <laughs> the mind has been so ugh, and the body has been so fractious and if you look at why you could sit through this it's probably because you were just listening you were just yeah. listening and yeah, in doing well, that you couldn't you couldn't go with these stories that your mind is telling you about the, you know, you should be able to make this go away or some, some whatever is telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I hope you feel better soon. Yeah, no, thank you. I feel better already. <laughs> thank just, you very much. Just be what you are in this moment. And if that's ill, then be that. So yeah. Don't fight it. That that saps our strength. In, you know, yeah, do I needed you to happen. tell me that. I, took, I, I knew that, but I wasn't <laughs> just one <wasn't> happening. <laughs> it's not a failure is it to to be ill it's not a failure it's just what is yeah you know whatever the label is that we're given to that here it's covid it could be flu it could be anything yeah. but yeah yeah okay so you can, uh, relax and enjoy more timelessness also not <laughs> asleep yeah <laughs> thank you thank you okay so we'll go to saima and we'll then we'll leave it there for today hi how are you doing um, hi good um, I have two questions, but I appreciate you answering the one that you think would be most helpful uh, in this step. I also I appreciate the homework and uh, the first few days, of course, it was the same. It was really hard, but yeah. it's been two weeks, I think, or at least it feels like two weeks. And eventually you know, the question dissolved, which was like the least thing I expected, like, I Just remind that, me of the question. Um, the question oh. was like, why don't I want to allow myself to follow the things that make me happy over the ideas of what I should do? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. And uh, with time that dissolved like that, um, that um, resistance or whatever, and the need for the question disappeared. There was no answer, but the need for the question disappeared. And in its place, it feels like it's there's this power that's replaced like a, whatever that, that was taking place because that was the thing I was, that was blocking me the most. And now yeah. I only, now it's like information from the outside only gives me so much change on how I feel inside. And on one side, I'm happy for it because if someone treats me in a way that I used to label as a discriminative or whatever, it doesn't change the internal um, state as much. Bring it down. Yeah. No. But at the same time, I know someone treated me in a way that before I would have just fully thrown myself into it in a nice way, like a really nice person who smiled and was like, like almost seeking for that um interaction and that's like I would have really thrown myself in there but I just watched myself unaffected like I just watched myself have like almost sort of like a distance of like I see you I appreciate you but I don't want to play that game of like of um where we're being overly you know, nice and and then that worried me a little bit. You so, know? so why 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 not play this game? If somebody wants to play with you, somebody really wants to generate a good feeling between you both and really sort of lift this energy. Yeah. Um, if you look at why not, why why don't I want to go there? Why am I keeping this distance? It's probably because of some fear that I'll have to experience the opposite of that you know if I go up I'm gonna to have to come down at some point but that's not really um that's really the major benefit of getting out of the duality of me and other I don't have to keep experiencing the opposite I get the highs without the lows okay yeah because and life will begin the... to give you people that want to play with you now because mm -hmm. you're determined to let this joy in and it's a uh, it's not an artificial, you know, if somebody says to you, oh, you're looking really lovely today and that dress looks amazing on you. We have this momentary like, oh, thank you very much, you know, and we feel really good. But it only lasts a second. This is different to that. It's an actual joy, isn't it? It's not a momentary happiness. It's this other body that's here is willing to work with me for both of us to allow our joy to come from the inside out even more in this moment. Mm. That might look like, having a coffee together and a giggle, telling old stories or, you know, fun times, fun memories, reminiscing, whatever it looks like, it won't come with the downside afterwards. 
Okay, now that's that is helpful. And uh, but the interaction was like almost 10 minutes apart. And it the resisting the joy came first. And at the same time, resisting the hurt came second. But I didn't, you know, and I felt like they were similar. Like my the distance between us was the same. And I'm not sure how to how to walk around without that distance, like without that how to walk around open. And it's simply to want to, if you if you want to, and to look at why it's not a good idea. Our mind can have a sense that joy has an opposite. Right? And, and joy has no opposite. Love, joy, bliss, peace. They're not in the world of duality. They don't have an opposite. Happiness has the opposite of sadness. Um, all of that. But the separation, the distance can be that, uh, firstly, I reject joy because I reject it's seeming opposite, but does it really have an opposite? And are you really getting it from that being, or is it just coming yeah. the certain moments where it's more allowed from you? Yeah, it's almost like I'm holding on to this, that joy that's already here now. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is good enough. Like this is better than what used to be there before. And I don't want to gamble with whatever is going to I might lose it. Because I might lose it, because it's finite, limited supply, joy might run out, all of that, right? But for the rest of your life, life is going to be asking you to allow more peace, love, and joy. It's still the same for me every day. No matter how good I feel, mm. there's always an opportunity to feel even better. That's constantly the natural state of my being flowing through as this body mind vehicle, always increasing. There's no ceiling, no limit. It literally is unlimited joy, peace, love. And every day we're feeling more of that, you know, and, and these ideas come up then that there's a, there's a ceiling on it, there's a limit on it, or I better conserve the joy I've got because it might run out and things like that. Mm. You see those subtle ideas. Yeah, yeah. And how would you interact with um, with a being in front of you who's having the in projecting the ideas of you on i mean projecting onto you the ideas of you and you can see where they're coming from but how do you interact with that or do you allow yourself to go down at the moment because that is what is happening like or it, it doesn't yeah. affect you you can only go down. Let's say somebody's telling me their very strong ideas about me. Mm. Before that used to really bring me down. I really listen to that. Um, now, it doesn't have any effect on me because my own opinion of myself is most important uh, than anyone else's now. I've really, really worked on that. And I've also recognized that, that what that being is telling me is what they think about themselves, actually. Mm. They think they're saying it about me, but I am them, so they're talking about themselves. They don't realize that, of course, most times. And also, what they think about me is coming through their belief that they're a separate being, and also them thinking that I'm a separate being. So this truth that's trying to come through this being is so very distorted and diminished by the time it comes through these thoughts, usually they've got a lot of unworthiness too, like all human beings have. So two ideas of separate being, a whole heap of unworthiness, and then they're talking about what they think of me, that by the time it comes out of their mouth, even if they don't speak it, actually, what they're saying is so very distorted from what is actually true, that it's... um. It's like they're talking in their sleep. It's like they're having a bad dream with their eyes open. And yeah. they can't help that. They really can't. They're, they're programming who they, who they think that they are, who they think I am, is what's talking through their mouth in that moment. As they're you're saying that, it just felt like I've been, something softened and all this energy was allowed to flow 
between between me Every, and this yeah everyone everyone is uh, is sleepwalking everyone is um no, nobody's having a real conversation with each other they're all cost through nobody's fault they're all hypnotized by this idea that they're separate that they're not good enough they're all hypnotized by this idea that there's other beings out there so their worst fears about themselves are, are talking through their mouths and and that feels so painful that the only thing that most of us can do is try to project it onto someone else and or, or it turns inwards and we become very depressed and things like that yeah. but if you realize that what you're actually hearing is so distorted and uh like trying to shine a really bright light through a tiny tiny hole you're only seeing a little tiny bit of that light then by the time you actually get to it and that's not a reflection of of the truth is it that's um very very diminished version of it so it's easier then to just kind of not take it personally to realize you've done that to other beings we've all done that to other beings we said things we didn't mean about them based on what we thought was going on you know so appreciate the light uh, the light analogy uh, for some yeah. reason it speaks really well to me the second question is, it's not in the last sangha i attended there was a meditation at the end and during the meditation at some point everything went white for like a split moment it's a it's a thing that happens but slowly usually not so not so sudden and that created like a knee-jerk reaction inside of me that you know pulled back really quickly and I just I thought I would ask you if you have any opinions on it's that. um it's quite common I used to experience things like that myself um sometimes when I was asleep at night it, it was almost like somebody was shining a really bright light um, and I even with my eyes closed there's this really intense light and um it, it was really when I looked it was only how my body was uh, as I go beyond my thoughts more energies allowed into my body and sometimes that's a big surge, especially if you're in deep meditation or, or, or you know, just relaxing. This surge of energy can really appear as a bright light. Your body might translate it as heat, as light, all of that kind of thing, you know? Okay. Now, I was just wondering that, is there a way to deal with that fear? Or is it just something that I'll just... I just have to let it be as it is and the process unfolds just by itself. Examining what you, what that light is, really look at it. What what actually is that? Because the fear is from what you think it is. It's something going wrong, says mind. Mm, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to talk to you. Okay. So, thank you, everyone, for your uh, questions that you sent in, for your feedback and your wonderful sharing. And just to remind everyone that uh, the next satsang will be on the 11th of August now after a break. So thank you. Namaste.